This is George Raft to tell you about con men and their rackets. Listen. Got a match, soldier? Sure. Thanks. Where are you headed? Port Riley. Hey, what do you know? I'm taking the same train. Say, we got a half hour wait. What do you say we pass a little time flipping coins? In a moment, the confidence man takes the service man to the cleaners. A service man with a large discharge envelope under his arm is a real fall guy for the confidence man. For discharge means a wallet full of severance pay. The con man doesn't waste too much time starting the coin flipping. Heads. Tails. Hey, two to one that fellow over there is going to ask to join us. If he does, what do you say we take it? You flip a head every time, and I'll flip a tail. That way, either you or I will win all the tosses. Sure enough, in a few minutes, the man has to join you in a few rounds of odd man. You can't turn down a sure thing, so you tell your new buddy it's okay with you. With every toss, the stakes climb higher. Sure enough, the stranger never wins. But neither do you. All the money goes to your partner. You're not worried, though, for you know he'll split the money with you later. Just when your funds are down to zero, the stranger gets sore and calls it quits. Your buddy gives you the high sign to follow him to an out-of-the-way place for the payoff. In a moment, I'll return with the details of the payoff that never paid off. Huddled in the corner, your partner is just about to hand over your share of the loop when the stranger suddenly appears. He called you both crooks and says he's gone for the cops. Run, kid. I'll meet you on the train and we'll put there. Both of you take off pronto. You head straight for the train, which is just pulling out. Later on the speeding train, you look for your partner. It may be some time before you realize that he never made it. And you think maybe he's been caught. Or you may never discover the truth that he stayed behind on purpose to divide your money with his pal, the stranger. This isn't the only dodge used to bilk servicemen out of money. Listen to what happens when a soldier drops into a cheap little nightclub. You want to buy me a bourbon and ginger, honey? Sure. Waiter, two bourbons and ginger. Been in the army long, soldier? About eight months. Well, down the hatch. Here's looking at you. What do I owe you, waiter? Eight dollars? You better pay, honey. They're pretty tough around here. See what happens when a soldier gets lonesome and wants a drink? And the B-girl's drink didn't even have any liquor in it. But the soldier paid, and the money went into some crook's pocket. This is George Raff, listening again for another story about con men and their rackets. your garden with world traveler, artist, and author, Hope Shippey. The older I get, the lazier I get. I've become allergic to poison ivy. When I brush against certain evergreens or pull certain weeds, I develop a rash. When I bend to pull a weed, I creak, and if I pull too many, I ache. Obviously, something had to be done, and I'm doing it. I'm mulching. It's easy to defend my stand. Mulch keeps the weeds down. The few that do come up are easy to pull. The earth stays moist. Let me quote Webster. Mulch, any substance, straw, sawdust, leaves, paper, etc., spread upon the ground to protect the roots of plants from heat, cold, or drought, to keep fruit clean. Sounds ideal, doesn't it? And it is. I use hay under my melons and tomatoes, sawdust under lettuce and my cultivated blueberries. I leave the leaves nature supplies so bountifully, especially in my wildflower garden. There are modern plastic substitutes for paper and building paper. 
I also put ashes around my roses, peat moss around my chrysanthemums. And there's a mulch I like best, which Webster didn't mention. In just a moment, I'll tell you what it is. My favorite mulch for trees and shrubs, which the Japanese have used so successfully for centuries, is rock. I'm used to rocks. The pastures of New England, where I was born, were rocks studded by glaciers. I live in rock-based Manhattan and vacation in St. Croix, where the soil is lumpy marl made by coral. I've always liked rocks. When we went to Martha's Vineyard, I picked up a bushel or more of round, ocean-smooth stones. When I was more energetic, I collected the small stones I heaped around my trees, but now I buy walnut-sized gravel. The results were good, but the decor was sloppy. Recently, a young friend from the Virgin Islands did some rock mulching, which has spruced up not only the spruces, but the whole garden. He made circles about five feet in diameter of good-sized rock, filled them five or six inches deep with gravel. Around the star magnolia, he made a star. Where it suited the contour of the ground, he continued a straight line or a curve. No matter what the shape, they're filled with mulch. No matter what the mulch, they're always neat. And it's a darn sight easier than pulling weeds. This is George Raff to tell you about con men and their rackets. Listen. Bingo! This sounds like a bingo game, but it's really a bunko game. I'll be back in a moment to tell you how that makes a difference in your pocketbook. Bingo is not only a lot of fun, but a chance to win some money. Bingo! And the lady wins again. All right, ma'am, let's check your card. Three. Right. Seventeen. Right. Thirty-two. Right. Fifty-seven. Right. Sixty-three. Right. And the little lady collects a big fifty-dollar prize. Oh, I'm so thrilled. I won again. Once again, the little woman in the green hat wins a big prize. She's pretty lucky. That's her third win tonight. Lucky? Luck has nothing to do with it. Right after the game, the prize money will go back where it came from, into the pocket of the con man. The little lady will simply get a salary for her night's work. You see, the bingo game is rigged, fixed to take money from the suckers. How is it possible to run a crooked bingo game? Easy if you know how. I'll be back in a moment to explain. The lady who won the big prize in the bingo game is a shill. In fact, she's one of two shills. Usually nice little old ladies who sit with the other players. It's going to be tough making a living now. In bingo, numbers are called out one after another by a pit man. Anyone having those numbers on a card covers them with a chip, counter, or a bean. Five numbers covered in a straight line in any direction makes a bingo. But in a bunko game, as soon as one of the lady shills has four numbers covered, she puts a high stack of chips on the card as a signal. When the next number is called out, the woman says bingo. The pit man comes over, picks up her card, and carefully covers the fifth number of the row with his thumb. To prevent anyone from seeing it, it isn't a winning one. He takes the card over to the other shill as a witness while he calls off the five winning numbers. Well, that's just the way the racket works. You seem to know all the angles. To everyone watching, this procedure looks honest. If either shill is lucky enough to have a real bingo during the game, the pitman lets someone else check the card. In bingo, keep your eye out for a signal, such as the sudden appearance of a high stack of counters by a steady winner. Another good idea is not to gamble. This is George Raff, listening again for another story about con men and their rackets.
Here's hope for your garden with world traveler, artist, and author, Hope Shippey. north with our few warm months things grow slowly in the Caribbean quickly it's always summer never colder than 68 degrees in my garden on St. Croix in the Virgin Islands we have about the same amount of rain as New York usually in the form of brief showers evaporation is rapid because of the trade winds and the sun which shines every day there are flowers all year, but the flamboyant and the most impressive display of blossoms comes at the same time as northern summer. During dry spells, the island looks brown from the air. A few heavy showers and it's green again. Cut a slip of croton or hibiscus, thrust it in the earth, and then reach for the pruning shears. Plants jump out of the ground when you put in a seed. Unless you prune heavily during the rainy season, you soon have a jungle. Tantan and other unwanted growth, most of it thorny, flourish. And the weeds, well, I'll be back in a moment to tell you about the weeds. I have a gardener whose name is Benjamin, but he's called George. I mention this because it's typical of the confusion in names. Lilac, wisteria, lady slippers are not the same plants known to New Englanders. But it's the weeds which are the bane of my existence there. George is a good gardener, but there's no meeting of our minds as to what is or is not a weed. I'm convinced that every plant which is inedible, bears no fruit, or has no practical use is a weed as far as he's concerned. Many things I consider weeds are valuable to George. Pull that, I'll say, pointing to an unknown in an otherwise neat flower bed. But that's tea, George will say, or a medicinal herb, or something to scour pans. Well then, transplanted, I compromise. When I'm off island, George writes to me. He once wrote, we had good rain. The spavinkly spread all over the putton garden. Sight unseen, I know that to me Spavinkley is a weed. Which one? Callaloo, which is a sort of spinach? And what, since George doesn't swear, is my putton garden? The seed bed where I have slips? The last flower bed I put on in the new house? I won't know till I return to St. Croix, where I guess I'll never know when a weed is not a weed. Next time, I'm going to talk about ginkgo trees. Con men and their rackets. Listen. Yes, can I help you, ma'am? Uh, you had an ad in the paper about some fur coats? Yes, we have some stunning coats. So please come in. And you walk right into the trap of the fur fake. In a moment, I'll return to tell you how he operates. Today is your lucky day. You are about to buy a fur coat at a terrific bargain, you think. Let's listen. I'm so thrilled. I've never owned a fur coat before. Right this way, please. I have some beautiful furs here in this vault. Gorgeous. They certainly are. These furs belong to Anne Duval. You know, the famous magazine cover model. Really? Yes, uh, they've only been worn a few times. Unfortunately, Miss Duval became ill in Paris, and, uh, well, frankly, she needs some money. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, what is this coat? Ah, I see you have excellent taste. This is a summer ermine. Isn't it a beauty? Oh, it certainly is. And because of the situation, you can have it at a real steal. Just $299. Well, I really can't afford it, but it's so lovely. 
I'll take it anyway. The coat is a steal, all right, but not for you. First of all, the fur coat is not ermine, but weasel. Summer ermine is just a name used to confuse you. By pretending they belong to a celebrity, you are duped into thinking you're getting a bargain. I'll be back in a moment to tell you how you can outwit the fur faker. A fur coat is sometimes a woman's proudest possession. The first rule in buying a fur coat is to know what you're getting. Hudson Bay Sable, for instance, is just a phony name for Martin. And Coney or Lappin are trade names for Rabbit. How can I tell which fur I'm getting? Rule one is to make sure your sales slip gives you the right name of the fur. And if you have any questions, ask for answers. Legitimate merchants are glad to tell you the facts. They will tell you whether the furs have been dyed or shaded. You can tell if fur has been dyed by blowing apart the fur and examining the leather. Natural leather is very light in color. If the fur has been dyed, the leather will be dark. The coat I bought lasted exactly one season. Remember, if you don't know the merchandise, know the merchant. If you don't, it may turn out that the animals aren't the only ones who get skinned. This is George Raff, listening again for another story about con men and their rackets. Mr. I have some old gold I could sell you. That is, if you offer good prices. I'll be right back to tell you the sad story of the old gold racket. All that glitters is not gold. You heard that plenty of times. Yet the con man can still fool you if you're not wise to his racket. But the things I have are so old-fashioned. I don't see why you want to buy them. Well, that doesn't matter, as long as they're gold. Uh, just what do you have? I think I can make you a very good deal. Well, I have some gold mountings that belong to my grandmother, that sort of thing. I've never thought about selling them before. I'll gladly give you the current top price for them. Uh, see, here's the latest official government book listing the amount of gold per pennyweight. Well, you can take a look at the stuff, I guess. Well, while you get the things, I'll set up the scale so I can weigh them. Mm, well, I've got most of it in this cabinet drawer. Looks like you have some good items. Uh, let's get started. First, we place your gold items in one pan of the scale. And in the other, we place a stack of brand new pennies. I don't understand. Well, since gold is measured in penny weight, the number of pennies that balance your gold will fix the price. I never knew it was done that way. You watch as the man carefully balances the scale with your gold on one side and the pennies on the other. Then he shows you the official book, so you can see for yourself the legal price you get. It's not as much as you had expected, but you figuring something is better than nothing. And after all, it is the highest price you can get. As quoted right in the government book, or is it? In a moment, I'll return to tell you how easily you can be fooled. Like the man showed you, gold is measured in pennyweight, all right. But pennyweight is the name of the unit of weight. And our penny coins have nothing to do with it. Actually, a penny weighs twice as much as a pennyweight. That means you got half the money due you from the obliging gold buyer. I wish I'd known that before. Of course, the police are always on the trail of these bunco artists. But like bad pennies, they usually turn up to jip you in some racket. For instance... He might send you a postcard like this. Dear Madam, your name has appeared in print. Our clipping service will send you the item upon receipt of one dollar. Oh, well, that must be about Felicia's wedding. I'd like to see that clipping. If you do send a dollar, you'll get back your name and print all right. Clip from the telephone book. Barnum was right when he said there's a sucker born every minute. <laughs> Listen. Henry, look at this ad. They're offering a terrific buy on name brand TV sets. And they're only $59.95. I think I'll call them tomorrow. Isn't that a real bargain? A bargain, maybe. 
but a sensational deal for the confidence man. I'll tell you why in just a moment. More than $250 million worth of goods will be sold by hook and by crooks this year. Yes, madam, we have a terrific buy on some brand name TV sets. Now, these factory rebuilt sets are only $59.95. No money down, take as long as you want to pay. You can also get a beautiful TV stand absolutely free. Now, what time would it be best for you to have a demonstration? Tomorrow will be all right. Now look, I'm sorry I wasn't able to bring one of those 59.95 jobs out to your home for a demonstration, but we sold the last one this morning. But I brought some pictures of some other wonderful sets we have that are good buys too. Won't you be getting any more of the ones you advertise? Well, yes, but I can't guarantee any delivery date on them. Now take a look at this picture. You can tell it's a great set. You know, it's really made by a famous manufacturer for our company. They just uh, give it another name. How much is it? $189. Oh, that's a lot more than the ones you advertise. Well, that's true, ma'am, but realize now you're getting a brand new set. Well, I would rather have a new set, of course, but... No matter what you buy from this fast-talking salesman, you'll be swindled out of your money. In a moment, I'll be back to tell you how. The Batum and Switchem racket is the biggest chip and most widespread swindle used today, and it's one of the toughest for the average person to fight. The reason is that these bunco artists have heard every objection and question to their sales pitch, and they know every answer in the book. So whatever he tries to sell, be warned in advance. When an offer states a product has been factory rebuilt, it doesn't necessarily mean the factory whose name it carries. It could have been rebuilt in the con man's garage. Don't be misled by famous sounding brand names either. What is the best way of not getting swindled? Your best protection is to keep clear of anyone using bait advertising. They advertise products at very low prices. When the salesman calls on you, he knocks the advertised item and tries to trick you into buying something more expensive. Now, don't let this ever happen to you. <laughs> This is George Raff. Listen in again for another story about con men and their rackets.